<clears throat> Hi everyone, thanks for coming to uh, see the Cambium Network CIF funding webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the text box on the right and uh, we'll either answer them as we go along or maybe at the end. Um, and without further ado, uh, here is Troy Conley to uh, give you the first part of your presentation. Thank you very much. Colin, and thank you everyone for, for joining the webinar today. Um, we think we have a pretty exciting agenda to talk about. As you know, the, the CAF reverse, the upcoming CAF reverse auction gives local service providers an opportunity to gain subscribers in census blocks um, supported by funding from the federal government. Uh, we have a full agenda today that I will show you as soon as I can figure out how to increment this slide. Um, <coughs> we, we believe uh, what we've tried to do today is we've put together an educational uh, agenda to talk you through uh, what the CAF process is how to work through the process, identifying vertical assets in your territory. For those of you that aren't experienced with wireless, and we've seen in the past that that um, several bidders, at least in a rural broadband experiment, weren't uh, wireless, uh, didn't have a lot of wireless experience. So identifying vertical assets is something very important uh, that we'll talk about. We've got a good lineup of speakers. Uh, we'll start it out with an overview. We'll talk about vertical assets, and then, of course, we'll talk about fixed wireless products. As the organizer of the webinar, uh, we believe that fixed wireless has the technical capabilities and the cost effectiveness to help you craft a, a winning bid for the upcoming uh, CAF reverse auction. And, and we know that because we've seen that in past experiences like in the rural broadband experiment. So we've got a lot of slides. We've got a lot of uh, uh, we've got a lot of slides. We so we're going to talk kind of fast on this. So we're going to go ahead and move along. Once again, like uh, Colin said, if you have any questions, please type them in the box as we go along, and we'll try to answer them as we go. Before we get kicked off, I want to go over a little bit of of the history and the timeline of what the Connect America Fund is. As you all probably know, in November 2011, the FCC uh, released a detail of, of the transition from the USF to the, the broadband-oriented Connect America Fund. Uh, CAF Phase 1 was offered in, in November of 2011, bandwidth requirements at 4.4 meg down, 1 meg up um, were the requirements at the time. Uh, most importantly, or one of the most important things, is 100 milliseconds of latency because the FCC has mandated that any company providing broadband has to also be able to provide voice over this type of, of mechanism. So therefore, uh, the 100 milliseconds is, is really important. They released $300 million. The price cap carriers only accepted 115 million of that $300 million. Um, and they continued to balk moving forward. There were a lot of petitions that they filed. Uh, they continued to balk going forward uh, at a lot of the provisions of the CAF phase one. Uh, the FCC, frustrated with the acceptance of the price cap companies, initiated the rural broadband experiment in July of 2011. We believe that that probably formed the basis of how this reverse auction is going to take place, and, and Ted will talk about this. But the bottom line was the FCC, frustrated by the uh, uh, the continuing obstinance, if you will, the price cap carrier said, if we can't get them to provide broadband, we'll find somebody who can. So they came up with a $100 million uh, budget for the FC, for the rural broadband experiment. Uh, they received 600 project bids for 76,000 census blocks. They actually, they received bids by $800 million over what was offered in the rural broadband experience, uh, rural broadband experiment. They chose around 40, and the initial winners were 14 wireless ISPs, seven local telephone companies, four power companies, and two cable companies. So it showed them that if they continued to get a lot of resistance from the price cap companies, then there were other people that were lined up 
that would provide broadband service to these uh, to these areas. So through through the experience that they had, the positive experience they had in the rural, rural broadband experiment, they rolled out CAS Phase Two, where they basically told the price cap companies, "Look, we have people lined up to serve these people, and if you continue to refuse to serve them, then we will find someone who will." So they released in Phase Two 1.7 billion dollars. Uh, the price cap companies, AT&T and, and CenturyLink and Frontier, and the others lined up, and they accepted $1.5 billion of that. They had the right to refuse certain census blocks that they didn't want to serve, so they chose the ones that they wanted to, and they left the others open. Those are the ones that will be available for the reverse auction uh, whenever it comes. It's important to note that with CAF Phase 2, and actually it was started with rural broadband experiment, uh, that the required speeds were 10-1, and the 100 milliseconds of latency stayed in place. Now, uh, there's a lot of talk about 25-3, and, and we think they'll eventually go to that, and I think Ted will talk a little bit about that as well. But in the phase two of the CAF that the price cap carriers took, uh, it, it was 10-1. So we're here today to talk about the CAF phase two reverse auction. And, and basically what that is, is it takes the census blocks that the price cap carriers refuse to serve and will put them in reverse auction for local service providers that can provide the minimum speeds and the minimum technical requirements that's laid it out in the further notice of proposed rulemaking. Originally it was slated at about $175 million annually uh, that's what's 1.75 billion over a 10-year period because this is a 10-year, uh, this is a 10-year award. It's since gone up, and Ted will talk about that. And originally there was only 20 states, but now there are census blocks available in all 50 states. So with that, uh, and one, once again, I want to highlight that it is a reverse auction. So when these bids go in, the FCC is going to be looking at who's serving what census blocks, what kind of speeds and, and, and technical uh, requirements that they can meet, and what's the price that they're, that they're um, submitting on their bid, because the lowest price that meets the technical requirements will win those census blocks. So with that, I am now going to turn this over uh, to Ted Osborne, who will take you through who will take you through the CAF overview and the uh, process for bidding. Ted, you the man. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate the introduction and the uh, opportunity to be with you today. I think uh, you stated it quite well uh, in terms of teeing up uh, where we are with the uh, Connect America Fund Phase Two auction uh, that will uh, be very much in play for the next year. And I uh, just want to ask Troy, the, uh, I've revised the screen. Has everybody seen that okay? All right, assuming uh, uh, I, we... I assume that we can, uh, the screen is shown. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. I thank Troy and the Canyon team for hosting today's event, and I thank you for attending uh, this briefing on the Connect America Fund. Uh, as Troy actually did mention, uh, you, you now know that funding is available in actually nearly all U.S. states, and I think the Connect America Fund is very serious business. It should not be taken lightly. As a, the program, I believe, is uh, going to change rural broadband uh, forever. This phase two auction is looking to fund up to one and a half million locations, rural locations, with an annual budget of $215 million per year for each of 10 years. Uh, the subsidy will be provided as a grant to the lowest cost bidder per the rules that we will discuss today. Um, commentary, local operators, I believe with existing infrastructure near where subsidy is available will have the advantage if the bidder is qualified and highly prepared. 
The Connect America Fund, you hear referred to as CAF. Our agenda today has a simple purpose, to provide you with an education on the CAF program so that you may be better prepared to determine your level of interest as a prospective bidder in this upcoming auction. We're going to organize our topic to first provide some background history on CAF. Then we will break down the elements of the auction, where and how much subsidy could be available, the eligibility requirements, rules, and bid qualifications. My personal goal is to provide you with insight to help you to determine if CAF is a good fit for your business. Then we'll bring it back together to discuss how to proceed. A little background on myself. I am a former WISP founder and operator. I researched Ted, you, the... Ted, Ted, did you increment the slide? I did. We should be seeing the presenter background. Okay, I, I still see the first one. There we go. Uh, let's see. It looks like I'm going to have to increment your slide, so just let me know when. Okay, um, then let's go to slide three, please. Okay. The, uh, as I was indicating, my background is that I founded and uh, operated a WISP dating back to 2003. I uh, began to use the precursor of the Cambium product line dating back to that point in time. And we were exclusively on the Motorola Canopy platform uh, during the five years that I owned and operated the business. Um, in 2008, we merged that business into uh, Jab Wireless, otherwise known as Rise Broadband. And since that time, I have been under the business of WISP Partners to advise on rural broadband development. And uh, I did participate in the reverse auction, or pardon me, in the uh, rural broadband experiment in 2014 as the project manager where we won uh, bids for 10 locations in five states for just under $17 million. And today I provide strategy and corporate development advisory services around rural broadband. Next slide, please. Slide four. Yeah, I'm there. Oh, thank I'm you. On. Hang on. Your fourth slide is actually slide eight. Okay, go ahead. All right, we're looking now at uh, the slide of the United States depicting green areas that were eligible for funding for the phase two proceeding. And due to the uh, statutory requirements that was determined to be the obligation under the FCC, the price cap carriers or the incumbents or you know, the large telcos, as you see here, were provided the first bite at the apple that Troy had earlier mentioned. Uh, this uh, uh, was in August of 2015 that these price cap carriers made their determination as to uh, how much of the, uh, of the subsidy they would accept and how much of an obligation they would make. These uh, large telcos either had to elect or decline their statewide commitment for all territories within a state. Uh, and um, so as a result, we see in the next slide that um, the price caps accepted the offer very aggressively. And in fact, it surprised us uh, to a large extent that they did take one and a half billion dollars a year off the table. Um, the required performance standards, as Troy indicated, uh, do require a 10-1 level service to be built out over six years. And that requirement uh, to serve voice and other interactive applications that are important to all users today had a requirement of uh, 100 milliseconds round trip latency and at least 100 gig of data usage per month. There were no technology restrictions at all. Uh, the remaining areas left behind by the telcos are to be funded through this upcoming auction. In the next slide, we see the remaining subsidy of $175 billion a year. This is um, 
something that uh, has been out there for some time now, about a year, so you've likely seen this. Here is where we see, for example, that AT&T decided to leave Missouri, Nevada, and Oklahoma aside and not make the statewide commitment. And then another example, Verizon, which operates most predominantly in the eastern seaboard states, also declined to participate. In the next slide, we put some numbers behind the states that are available in those 20 states that Troy had mentioned. However, what is uh, news to a lot of folks, I'm sure today on the call, is that the FCC has added an additional $40 million in annual subsidy, which includes uh, all 48 uh, contiguous states and Hawaii. In the next slide, eight, we see uh, where we will break down now the elements of the auction and uh, <clears throat> where the subsidy is available. We'll discuss the eligibility, rules, and bid qualifications, and how to proceed. You may ask when, <laughs> I get this a lot, you may ask when uh, we can anticipate entering the auction process. It would appear that the bid window will open sometime next year. It could be early, it could be late part of 2017. I will warn you, however, that now is the time to prepare as the process is, um, is complex and the importance of your decisions are very important to you, uh, very real to you, I should say. So. Um, we will uh, go now and look at, please. We'll now look at the auction itself and see in this slide, uh, depicted in gold, the areas eligible for funding at the uh, census blocks that are shown here on the map. What is added is 29 additional states. So up until this change, we anticipated that there would be no eligible funding for states such as Texas and California, Oregon, Washington, the entire upper Midwest, and much of the Southeast. The, the changes, I think, are very significant. Some of you may have seen the CAM 43 file that the FCC published in August, just last month. Uh, where it showed 317,000 rows of census block data which had within the reserve amounts and locations in each state. Here is a one-page summary of uh, the, uh, the model where it shows the reserve amount and locations uh, per state. And I wanted to make a comment about what we mean by reserve amount. The reserve amount is uh, the, the highest amount of money that any one bidder can bid. And it's, so it is, the, it is the reserve price that the auction will not go above. Through the competitive bidding cycle, there will be some fraction of those uh, amounts of money bid by various players and I anticipate there will be overlap of various players in making bids in specific areas. Altogether, with the budget of $215 million annually and the nearly $1 billion of total reserve price, we have a coverage ratio of budget to reserve of about 22%. So that's an indication of uh, where, um, uh, of, of what might result throughout this process. Now in a perfect and efficient auction, everyone would bid distinct markets at exactly 22% of the reserve price and um, the FCC will have a great win. It's not going to happen that way, as I'm sure you can imagine. As we go to the next slide, we now visualize these uh, census blocks in this example in the state of Oklahoma, whereby these uh, blue areas show the census blocks uh, throughout the state. 
And all these all these maps have been created now, uh, whereby um, one can look and see where the um, auction money might be available. We're going to go in and drill down on that in the, uh, later in the presentation so that you get a sense for what information is provided to you during the auction. I get asked quite a bit, uh, how is this auction different from the rural broadband experiment? Uh, and uh, uh, serving as the project manager for the last uh, the last experiment, I immersed myself in this uh, to, to, to a large extent. And there were rules that were very onerous for the small uh, rural providers that are out there in rural America. And there's been a considerable amount of advocacy uh, in lockstep, uh, for the most part, between uh, the WISPA Trade Association, the American Cable Association, and the, um, and the rural Telecommunications Association, NTCA, I think it is, whereby uh, there's been a proceeding of, um, of um, uh, through the FCC where advocacy is asked for the rules to be altered in a manner where we can have greater participation in the auction that we failed to achieve in the experiment. So uh, at a very high level, and this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, let's review the key elements. And the, uh, you know, we know that there's considerably more money available over the 10-year period. Uh, we, we may recall that in the experiment, three years of audit financials were required. And typically, a small private business uh, has little requirement for an audit. Uh, however, the FCC does require some protection in knowing that the business is a qualified and going concern. As a result, they did determine relative to this auction that one year of audited financials are required. And to the extent that you do not have that going into the bid, should you be named a provisional winner, you are provided a six-month window to provide those audited financials to the FCC. Let's discuss the letter of credit that uh, is required in the auction as well. The letter of credit is the protection mechanism for the FCC to be good stewards of public monies, whereby this is a grant. The FCC would like a recourse to uh, draw back the amounts that have been provided as subsidy for the build of your network should you fail to meet the performance requirements that we will discuss just in a moment. The letter of credit requirement is a dollar for dollar requirement. And in the experiment, it lasted for all the monies provided for the entire 10 year period. And you should be, um, uh, you should know that these uh, monies carry a, um, a cost for having the bank support uh, that available line for you. As far as uh, uh, as far as drawing on that letter of credit, the rules state that uh, should you fail to meet performance standards in the annual reporting periods, you will be provided a period of time to cure. I believe it's six months. And to the extent that you cure the uh, deficiency, you will uh, not have any risk of that letter of credit being uh, taken. Um, and when it comes to this, we, we looked at the entire 10 years and asked, can we get a reduction of that amount as the network is built and certified? And the answer is yes. Uh, to the extent that you build the network over a course of time, you we can reduce the letter of credit uh, to a large extent as you move along. So this is not as onerous as it was in the experiment. Relative to the kinds of banks that uh, would be eligible to provide that letter of credit, we find that uh, whereas in the experiment it was 100 of the largest banks in the United States, and um, you know, typically a local rural provider does not work with uh, Chase or Bank of America. 
Rather, uh, they work. To t they tend to work with uh, maybe CoBank or uh, maybe a, a local bank uh, that is in your area. So the SEC determined that uh, to the extent that the bank is graded by an independent rating agency named Weiss with a rating of B minus or better, which includes about 3,600 U.S. banks, then that bank is therefore qualified to support you with a letter of credit. Uh, relative to the rules, good performance and tiers, uh, we have for the auction four technology neutral service standards with better flexibility to designate either high or low latency for each. And by technology neutral, the FCC is saying that a bidder can design wireless networks both licensed and license free. A minimum performance tier requires bidders to commit to 10 megabit downlink and 1 megabit uplink. Um, <clears throat> actually, yes, that's correct, the minimum. Uh, the baseline, which is where the FCC would prefer to go uh, as they try to move um, upwards toward rural households having the same level of service as those in urban areas, have moved to 25 over 3 megabits per second, each with a 150 meg a gig uh, data cap usage uh, allowance. The above baseline tier of 100 over 20 was established with an unlimited usage allowance, and gigabit with 500 megabit upstream commitment is also unlimited data usage. Note, and this is important, that when the SEC <coughs> states a performance tier of 25.3, for example, that means sustained rate during peak usage periods. The build-out completion dates uh, are 40% at the end of year three, 60 for four, until you get to the end of the sixth year where you are required to build out 100%. How to proceed. Um, so this, I'm going to tell you, is the methodology that I used in, uh, in preparing for the bids during the experiment. Um, I think first it's very important that you read the rules. Go to FCC.org, search for the Connect America Fund proceeding, and find the report and order that's dated May 26 of this year. Read it. It's, uh, it's very complex and difficult to comprehend. Uh, seek advice if you feel that you need it to understand your eligibility. Then if you believe you want to pursue the opportunity, refine your areas of interest, create mapping polygons to capture the underlying meta metadata, and assess uh, what your actual addressable market might be for that area. Determine what network you're going to build around the tiers. Uh, Work with your supply chain to qualify spectrum availability. Infrastructure capacities and costs for broadband and voice need to be determined, and you need to start to establish the banking commitment to prepare the standby letters of credit. Um, identify support professionals, such as professional engineers that are required to stamp the network design and project plan. And the, you must also be an eligible telecommunications carrier, so uh, making applications may be necessary with the state PUC. Uh, uh, from there, uh, it's important to create a business model that deeply understands all costs relative to timelines, penetration, and ARPU assumptions, and project the cash flow results. At that point in time, you will know where you can comfortably bid and be happy that you will be able to achieve the re responsibilities that the SEC will uh, hold you to. Um, in, in wrapping up, I will show you that here is another uh, state map, uh, state of California. It has $72 million in annual reserve, uh, uh, and it's about 88,000 locations that are available in California. As we drill down to just the upper one-third of the state, we can look at an individual census block to discover that in this particular case, right on the Nevada border, there are 20 locations. 
uh, with a reserve price of 35000 per year. I will tell you there's a great deal of variability in terms of the cost model relative to how much is provided per location. And in closing, I will tell you to bear in mind that the FCC has not made a final determination, but the, um, the areas that one can bid will not be as granular as a census block it was, as it was in the experiment, rather only census block groups or possibly census tracts. I'm guessing the former. And uh, in closing, I will tell you that uh, I wish you all the very best uh, in your uh, deliberations and decision making around CAF. I think it's very important, and uh, as Troy has asked me to let you know that I should put in a shameless plug uh, for uh, any support that you might need where I may be of value to you. WIS Partners is an assembly of uh, experts in this area, and we've been successful at raising public and private capital for growth. Our passion is real broadband, and I'd be happy to take uh, questions after today's conference. With that, I'll turn it back over to Troy. And again, thank you all very much. I think the best thing to do now that you have control is just to turn it over to Jeffrey. Okay. All right, I'm happy to do that. Jeff, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, let me... We apologize for the, the logistical challenges. This is our first time doing this with, with multiple presenters, so we're learning as we go. I, am, I typically am able to, oh, here we go. It's well, different on, on I, I understand. It's different for this particular version of the meeting. So one moment, please. Well, well, as you're working through it, Jeffrey, we have your first tower. Your first slide up says American Tower, Connect America. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and I'll, I'll start there. Show my screen. All right, where are we at here? Now, I'm not showing my screen. All right, I, I, I no longer see the screen, um, but uh, I, so I don't know if I now have control. If I don't, uh, if someone else does, feel free to, uh, I can share with you when to, when to turn the slides. Okay, go ahead. Okay, and I'll, I'll start by, well, first of all, thanks for your time. I, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time, so I'll, I'll kind of run through this um, as quickly as possible, but obviously there's a lot of information in these slides, so if folks have questions, you can refer to it then obviously reach out to me directly. Um, I've been with American Tower for over 15 years now in, in different sales capacities. I now oversee um, internet service providers nationally. Um, and over the last couple of months, American Tower and Cambium have really decided or made a decision to partner into uh, this realm of the opportunity of assisting folks and expanding and building new networks. Um, and that, how that has come about is really that American Tower over the last couple of years has realized the growth of our non-national customers. So we've basically grown a segment business for us which has national sales folks overseeing what we call segment customers like utilities and government and internet service providers, oil and gas, you know, machine to machine. And with that we just realized that those folks are growing, they need support and we needed to craft an offering specifically to them. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is uh, really who we are, um, how we support our customers, the available systems and tools that we have, and then some of the financial offerings to actually co-locate on our assets. So you know, there's an understanding of there's the areas that need to be covered. Cambion obviously has a great piece of equipment that can offer that coverage solution. And where we come to play is we own the assets in the areas that you can install your equipment on to actually propagate the signal. Um, so the next slide um, is, which I can't see, but it's our, our wireless communication site. That's my second slide. And then we can yeah, actually I'm at your, from there. I'm at, your, I'm at your third slide right now that talks about okay. towers and rooftops. Great. 
Great. All right. And this is really just a quick snapshot to show everyone who American Tower is. Um, oh, I started 15 years ago, and we just had uh, a, a small number of towers. Through the years, we've acquired assets and grown and built our own. So at this point, for the most part, who I interact with with Internet service providers are typically on the 40,000 towers and the 15,000 rooftops. Um, but we also have some sites that share generators, and we also are the largest DAS provider in the U.S. at 1,300 assets and locations. Um, but that's just really a snapshot of, of our asset base. We can go into the next uh, slide, which is really is our 4 WIS program, which we've really created. Uh, and I oversee WIS, but it can be identified for any, anyone who's trying to deploy CAF funds. So we'll roll to the next page, which talks about the co-location. And if we're, if we're there, really the lines are talking about leasing opportunities. And what we really wanted to do on this slide is describe to everyone what our assets look like and how they play into the CAF funds. So of our you know, 60,000 assets, 22,000 of our towers are outside of the top 100 BTAs, uh, where typically the, the CAF funds are being deployed. Um, and 79% of our, our non-urban towers are 150 foot in height. Um, obviously, offering higher uh, RAD centers gives you larger areas to propagate, more customers, more revenue opportunities. Um, so sometimes we've had some folks actually come to us. They might be on a grain silo or something other at a lower height. They can get on our tower, offer a, a higher coverage area, uh, and secure additional revenues. Um, the next page starts to talk about um, who we are from an RF consulting and GIS analysis. And what this really speaks to, and obviously we're not out designing networks, but for our customers, what we can do is assist in their network development. Um, so we have in-house engineers that can assist with design and analysis of, of potential networks. Um, and obviously that goes from anywhere of just uh, ground up new builds to optimization and backhaul. Um, and then we also have a GIS team that can provide mapping analysis. And we'll show you one of those maps uh, we did a quick snapshot on in a couple slides. But the way we look at things is different. And we've evolved in the industry to understand um, when we look at sites that we want to look at it the same way that our customers do. So we look at the population counts within three miles, how many households are in there, what the opportunity for revenue is there. So we're just making an educated decision about hey, this is a good location to deploy services. There's enough households underneath of it that are going to need service. Our rent would be an acceptable rate. Um, and so we have a much better understanding of that today than we have in the past. And we can deliver those files in, in any type of form you want, whether Excel, Google, Google Earth, and uh, any other type of mapping softwares. The next page is dedicated support. And this speaks to some changes that we've really just done over the last year, which is, uh, created a sales team that specifically sells to the segments. Um, what, what happened in the past was there was a, a lot of attention, typically to the big four. They're obviously the ones that uh, run the majority of our business, but we realized there's a, this, this segment business is, is growing continuously. And as a, a response to that, we've hired folks in each of our markets that strictly focuses on our segment customers. Um, we have a, a specific uh, project manager who just interacts with WIS. So as your applications go into our system, there's a single point of contact once they go into our system until basically your lease is completed and you're into construction. Um, our engineering, engineering team is there to support, whether from a design perspective or an actual structural perspective, because some jurisdictions require that. And then the, probably the most important folks to a lot of this build is our field operations technician. So uh, we've got folks in the local market that just maintain and operate the site. So when it comes time to do a feasibility walk or determine if the site can actually work for you, they're local in the market. They understand the, what kind of power is there, what kind of telco is there, you know, where you can go under the tower, and they actually take a face-to-face -face meeting on site. With all of those pieces in place, it just makes it an easier process for folks who, one, haven't done business with us in the past to understand our business, and then folks that have done business with us because today we do business with roughly 350 different WISPs. So the business is growing and the opportunities are there to, to partner. Um, the next slide, which is on their access, which is really one of our tools. And I'll speak to this, but it's, if you go onto our webpage and just go into on access, it just asks for a username and sets up a password. 
and it'll give you access to this. You don't have to be an existing customer. But this is a tool that we've created to, one, allow you to find sites, and I'll show you a quick snapshot of that. But then it's also to where you apply, where you track your systems, where everything is delivered to you uh, uh, over the air so that you've got 24-7 access into your projects. Um, the next page, it, it talks about this one, which I think is beneficial because as Ted talked about, um, there are areas that you might be specifically looking for to identify opportunities and markets you'd like to build. Um, and this is where we go into our, our, our site locator. Um, you can actually find the sites, and there's a couple uh, boxes here that are highlighted because you can drill down into here by address or by county or by state or by city, and then you can actually download this into, uh, if you uh, identify sites, you can download that, those, those, those sites into your databases. You can lay base maps over it so you can over, get population data in there. You can actually get it to a Google Earth format where you're basically looking at an Earth shot. Um, so it's a very useful tool, very interactive. You can save things within it um, and identify assets so you can easily come back and see them. Um, and the next page is the Connect America Phase 2 Auction Oklahoma map. So what, what our GIS folks did was uh, just pick the state by, you know, nothing other than, hey, it's in the middle of the country. So we picked Oklahoma. Um, and what we did is we took those, those uh, uh, identified areas that CAF funds are likely available and laid our assets over top of them. So you can see by this map that uh, if you wanted specifically to look at this and you reached out to American Tower to say, hey, what is you know, California or what does specific counties look like, we can actually produce those maps for you. Um, and then from there, obviously, we could partner with Canby and what does the opportunity for coverage look like and so forth and easily uh, design a system that can accommodate uh, the CAF funds to secure them for you. Um, into the next page, which is our network specifications and pricing consideration. And we can just go right into the next page, which is the site specifications. Um, and what I wanted to do here is to talk about this. And over the years, we've really dove into how our customers run their business and to try and better understand how we can price things, how, how we can create and craft a business model for them. Um, but what we also like to share that's important is how we look at things so that when you approach us or another another tower company, these are the things that uh, that we're typically going to be looking for to establish a price point for um, a co-location. And one is a preferred equipment height. There's a number of rad centers. So obviously, that's a center line where you install your equipment. We preferably like to have antennas and dishes at the same rad center. Obviously, it's just vertical real estate to us. So the less space you utilize on the tower, the less your rent would be. Um, the number of antennas and, um, that you install, typically there's a rad center, so if your equipment is installed there, typical, we've created with pricing models, so there are some that allow for, you know, three or six or nine, nine antennas, so you'll be, want to be specific about that. You know, is it an omni, is it a panel, you know, are there remote radio heads installed on the antenna that click into the back, is it a separate piece of equipment, um, and then obviously the microwave dishes. So. These are all things that we're looking at. And finally, it's just the ground space as well. So do you need to do a, a cabinet on the ground? Are you going to put in a, a, a small shelter? Can you go inside? Potentially, America Tower might own a shelter on site. Maybe you can go inside of our shelter. But those are the big three things that we look for when we're looking to establish price. Um, we can go into the next page, which is, you know, <clears throat> we make getting on air affordable and predictable. So these are some of our financial offerings. Um, and so we can go into uh, the next, which discuss monthly lease rate options. Um, and I'm assuming we're there. And, and I won't go into exact spec specifics on these, but what I want to have folks understand is that we work with a, a lot of different uh, businesses out in different markets. And really what we do is we've established a, a couple pricing scenarios that have worked. But truly, we craft a pricing model for what, what your business needs. Obviously, it has to be in a, a win for both companies. But we, we start here with rates, which might allow for growth. But I think that the evolution, which has been great for me to see over the last couple of years in this role, has really been the evolution of the discussion we're having. Uh, I like to say that we're having more carrier-style conversations um, about what the future looks like. Like, let's think about 
you know, future growth. Let's, let's look at capacity. Let's look at where you want to be in three years so that we can capture that. Like the goal is not to have you guys install day one. Six months later, you need to install more equipment because of capacity. Um, we need to discuss rate again. So we can capture everything in the beginning. So it's a simple, easy growth process for our customers. We'd prefer to do that. So that's why I say we're starting to have much more carrier style conversations. And I think the tools and systems that our, that our customers have today uh, are great. And uh, it's definitely evolving. So it's, it's making it a much easier process for us to craft offerings to our customers. Um, and then I'll, I'll end it with uh, the next slide, which is just my contact information. So as I said, I oversee um, our, our service pro internet service provider business. If, uh, if potentially you interact with someone who's a different contact in our, our segment business, I'll, I'll obviously share that with them as well. But we're truly here to, to grow the business, to grow the opportunities. Um, and we think this is a great a partnership, one, with Cambium, and two, the opportunity to, uh, to assist folks in the local market to build their business. And uh, that's it for me, Troy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm, I'm clear as to whether everybody is seeing the slide right now. Uh, so I'm going to go back to this. I think I've taken control again. Uh, if we had some logistical issues, I apologize. I'm going to go up to, we're running short on time, so I'm going to make this relatively quick because I want to be respectful of your time. There are multiple segments in building a network, as you all know, uh, long haul. If you have facilities uh, adjacent to a census block that you want to get into, obviously you can build fiber out there. Another way to reach it is through uh, long haul microwave. Uh, there are some customers that utilize DSLAMs and, and will we'll build this out by utilizing their DSLAMs. We have a product that reaches the middle mile. And of course, what we specialize in as much as anything else is, is last mile access through our point to multipoint systems. Uh, we have point to multipoint, we have point to point, we have licensed, and we have unlicensed, and we also have a product that pulls it all together that we call, that's a wireless manager that we call C and Maestro. Our long haul PTP820 is a multi gigabit um, microwave radio system with, with high spectral efficiency. I won't go through all the details because we're running short on time, but I'll be happy to talk to you about uh, all of this uh, if you'll reach out to me. Um, we have three different flavors. Once again, the, 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 the reverse auction is just that. It's a reverse auction, at least cost uh, with meeting the technical requirements will win the day for you. So we have three different flavors of the 820, the 820S, the small, the 820C, a, a multi-core radio that provides 1.5 1 plus, 1 .5 plus uh, with a gigabit speeds throughout the radio. These have different cost profiles. You may not necessarily meet, need the double core radio uh, for an area that you want to reach. You want to do just a single core one gig radio. You know, we can price those out for you to match what it is that you want to do to, to keep your pricing low. Um, 2048 Qualm, one gig in a single box. It's almost two gig with the 820C. Uh, highly reliable, supports multiple channel sizes. A very, very uh, advanced radio. Uh, this talks a little bit about the 820C. I'm going through this pretty quick. You can see that it'll support 1.0. It'll play 1 plus. 1 plus 0, 2 plus 0, uh, it'll be 2 plus 2. It can do a whole lot of different types of uh, transmission for you. Uh, and everything is built with the, eight, with the total cost of ownership built in. Ted talked about, you know, as you look at your network, you, you need to look at the total cost that you're going to get. Uh, double core radio uh, is going to give you, it's going to be lower in, in power, space, you know, when Jeff talks about the, the rent on the tower, uh, the smaller the radio, the less your cost is going to be to be able to put a radio up on the tower should you choose to do that. Uh, everything about the 820 is built with lower total cost of ownership built in. Our unlicensed radio, the PTP650, uh, used a lot by telcos for uh, DSLAM backhaul in a place that you want to extend your DSLAM out to be able to reach these speeds uh, closer to your customers. 
Uh, the 820 or the 650 is a, a great product for that. It's a near and non line of sight type radio, so you can put it on a 60 foot power pole and, and, and do point to point, to, point uh, to reach your remote customers. It'll provide up to 450 meg in 4.9 through 6 gig uh, frequencies, uh, 10 bits per hertz spectral efficiency, which is really cool. Uh, we set a world record with that. At one point, we shot right over top of uh, the Denver area at 124 miles not too long ago, and, and once again, very, very low latency. The latency number that you have to meet uh, in any CAF uh, funds is, is absolutely critical, so it's important to take a look at what the latency numbers are of the products that you would, that you would uh, utilize. Just a, a show of a, a DSLAM backhaul type application should you choose to use DSLAMs. Uh, our point to multipoint, we actually offer two different types of products with those. Our EPMP, uh, that's, a, that's a, um, a, a lower cost uh, point to multipoint product. It has many of the features of our flagship uh, PMP 450 product. Uh, it'll deliver 100 meg, actually a little bit greater than 100 meg per sector. Uh, it only comes in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz options. The, the PMP 450 that we'll talk about, uh, it'll deliver 245, 365, 5 gig um, uh, frequencies in that. It also supports 900 megahertz. So, uh, and then 900 megahertz is absolutely critical for those areas that has been tough to reach through any wireless, like behind trees or, or you know, anything like that. A 900 megahertz will burn right through a tree. So tree covered areas that a lot of carriers have been really leery of are now accessible with the 900 megahertz system. We recently introduced uh, what we call our PMP 450M or our Medusa product. Uh, the Medusa product will support up to 450 meg per sector. It's a massive new MIMO system uh, that utilizes beam steering to be able to uh, get multiple customers much more density than we had with our PMP 450 product. Uh, the 450, this says 125. That's the that's the existing product. Uh, they'll support now either 125 or 4, 450 meg, depending on what you want to use um, over a gig worth of tower bandwidth available. It's, it'll support symmetric or asymmetrical speed for the cap reverse option. Asymmetrical is probably what you're looking for. Uh, it also has to minimize interference, which is absolutely critical in, in building a wireless network. Uh, it has a GPS syncing capability, which means we won't have self-interference, uh, nor possibly will we interfere with anybody else around us, or will we will minimize the interference that they could cause. And the low latency that we have with the product, five to eight milliseconds, uh, will easily support VoIP or video if you want to offer triple play services in your network that you win for, for CAF. <coughs> the 450 looks kind of like this. Once again, it's available at 900 megahertz. Uh, multiple frequencies, uh, that's another thing you need to look at. Ted talked about finalizing, figuring out what kind of spectrum that you're going to be able to offer um, in, in your areas. Uh, we offer multiple frequency options for the 450 platform. Um, it's, it's the typical point to multipoint type application where you have an access point set on a tower somewhere. The subscriber module would connect to your customer's home. And then we also have what we call a CN pilot, which is our ATA that can provide VoIP services inside the house that will allow you to troubleshoot all the way into the home to see what's going on. Um, and this is the 900 megahertz product. Once again, very, very powerful product uh, for areas that were not reachable before, even utilizing our PMP 450 in the 5 gig or, or 2.4 gig uh, uh, radio. The 900 megahertz system uh, is not afraid of trees. It will it will go right through that. So for those really really hard to reach systems, if you want to do a census block, but say this is this looks harder to reach, and, and I may not be able to do that, uh, give the 900 megahertz system a try. I think you'll be pleased with that. 
the EPNT, like I said, this is our this is our lower cost product. It has it's an 802.11 in system. Um, it has a lot of the features of the PNP 450 as well, including the GPS syncing uh, at a much lower cost. Once again, our goal in, in helping you create a cap reverse auction bid is being able to meet the technical requirements at different cost profiles that you would need to be able to win. So the PMP 450 could be a choice. The PMP or the EPMP could be a choice. Um, you can choose there. And once again, I'm speaking fast because I want to be respectful of your time. It operates in the 5 gig, the 2.4 gig uh, on a 40 megahertz channel. You can get 200 meg out of this. Um, very nice, powerful, lower cost radio. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with it. We've got customers using both our 450 and our EPMP that have won rural broadband experiment grants in the past. We have planning tools for you. We have a product called Link Planner that's free to download. If you think you want to use wireless, you can download Link Planner, set up the, uh, the nodes that you want to reach, and all you have to do is put in the uh, location of the AP and the remote modules or the, the microwave backhaul links, tell it what height you're going to get, and Link Planner will utilize Google Earth to come back and tell you exactly what kind of performance that you're going to get. So as you analyze the census blocks that you're going after, you can utilize these free tools that we have to, to figure out whether an area that you want to serve is, is reachable via wireless or not reachable by, via wireless. It does the Link Planner does the EPMP, it does PMP 450, and of course it does all of our point to multi point products that will allow you to, to really engineer your area from your desktop. Uh, we also have tools that we can provide if you want to take a look at an area to see if you can provide it. Uh, we will come and help you with that. We'll engineer the area for you, and then we'll actually build a return on investment model for you as well. We'll show you what your costs are going to be. Uh, we will. We have this box that allow you to put your own costs in, so you can customize it exactly for you. It's not a vendor provided. This is what we think it's going to cost for you. You can put your numbers in there as well. So um, here we're running real close to time. We want to thank you again, everybody, for getting in. We hope you found uh, this webinar uh, educational. Uh, we're going to do it again in a month. If you want to sit in on that, that would be great. But we wanted to show you some options available as you look to being able to create your bid. So the, for the presenters today, if you need some help in designing your bid for the reverse auction, Ted can help you with that. That's what his company does. Uh, if you're unclear about vertical assets or you don't own any vertical assets in your own area but you want to be able to bid, uh, Jeffrey can help you with the vertical assets. And of course, we have the equipment that we believe and we've seen in the past has helped bidders win uh, awards from the FCC for things like the CAF reverse auction. So I want to thank you for your time. Any questions, you can submit them. Uh, we will we will absolutely answer them and get back to you and anything else that, that we can do for you, we'll be happy to do that. So well, we got 30 seconds left. Are there any are there any immediate questions before we uh, before we end the webinar? Yeah, real quick, this is Jeff. I got quite a few emails about my deck was never uh, wasn't visible, so I didn't know if you were going to share the deck or send it out to all the participants. Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, once again, thank you very much. Uh, we know your time is valuable and you spending it with us. Uh, we are very appreciative of that. So thank you for attending and have a great day.